Hello everyone, uh, this is Nelly and welcome to the second day of the Spring Blog Festival. Um, Sylvia is going to be presenting. Sorry Sylvia, I wasn't able to add it uh, to, uh, but I will, I'll let you start, okay, and then I'll add it in my other computer because I, I couldn't do it. I was uh, busy with Nancy. All right, is that okay? Or would you oh, like, yes. yeah. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, Nelly, do you mean my PowerPoint? Yes, I do. Sorry about that. I just got it now and I... Yes, okay. Yeah, today uh, it's a lot happening together. Oh, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Great to see familiar faces again from some very interesting teachers. Okay, uh, today is a kind of unusual presentation for me in a way um, because I'm going to talk about reflective blogging based on a book by David Dubel Bice called The Zen Act of Teaching. Um, now, it's kind of unusual. Okay, Abhilash, am I saying your name right? I wanted to say your name in the previous session and I was afraid I wouldn't say it right. Oh, uh, I'm Janet. Janet, have you also read the book? Yeah, I've got this quote in my PowerPoint too. So <laughs> I think it would be great to share it. And I'm so glad you're familiar with the book because it means we're going to have a great um, communication here, a great discussion here. Oh, great, Abilash. I'm glad I said that right. Okay. Um, no, will I try to upload it myself? No, no, I it's 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 here, it's here. Sorry, oh, uh, it's just perfect. that. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm trying so to. Oh, I love it, love it. Okay, go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you. Yeah, I have to say that um, it feels nice to be presenting about this kind of topic for a change and I feel like I'm just going to share some insights with friends here, okay? So, uh, you are more than you think, okay? That was the basic idea I got from the book and from my general attitude to life and other things I read. Um, so, all of this, what I'm doing here is going into the blogging and especially collaborative blogging. The Zen Act of Teaching was written 
precisely for professional development and teaching. Um, but when I read the book, uh, I thought I want to share this with everybody, you know. But of course, um, I. I, I didn't bring myself to setting up a whole series of webinars, but I just wanted to teach that book. I don't know if you've ever found a book and when you saw that book you wanted to teach the book or share it with other people. And I think I really did because I was already doing a lot of professional development work anyway, and I'm always into kind of philosophy and psychology. So, um, okay, first we're going to get into this mindset, okay? Um, get into the zone. Okay, this means that, well, you know what it means, but I'll say why I've put it here. Um, that for us to feel ourselves as teachers and to develop uh, from the inside out, uh, we've got to be in the right place where we are comfortable with ourselves. Um, the book I'm going to talk about gets you into the zone very, very easily because there are lots of um, concrete explanations and very simple quotes and then the deeper insights are very simple in themselves so uh, the Zen Act of Teaching is a very good title for the book because it's simplicity mixed with wisdom and all these little bits of poetry and philosophy mixed in uh, that's why I love the book as well if, if I see um, substance mixed with philosophy or poetry that speaks to me and we're going to talk about what speaks to us as well okay um yeah we're, we're going to talk um all about those things so this is about sharing who you really are as bloggers uh we want to share who we really are blogs are all about sharing and we've heard that throughout different presentations today and especially we heard it from the author panel from barbara and david and luke previously so i hope if anybody missed that, I hope you catch the recording, okay? Now, um, a reflective blog is kind of like your stream of consciousness if you're brave enough to just let your fingers do the typing, okay? Um, quite often, I try to focus on, focus on uh, the topic, the teaching, uh, the point of the article, but some other times when I write in a personal way, I just let my fingers type and... Um, I don't worry about what I'm going to produce, and they sometimes turn out to be the most interesting articles. Now, before we look at some parts of the book, I'm going to just talk about what reflective writing is or what reflective thinking is. So, going back here, we've got, um, okay, something that says a lot but nothing specific get into the zone share who you really are stream of consciousness um it sounds too surreal for practical teachers so that's why in the next slide the question is uh nelly can you move my slide please the question is what has this got to do with teaching and i put three questions here okay why where and how okay and the next slide will tell you what these questions might be so uh the next slide again please okay so how do we ask ourselves the right questions how could um some kind of philosophy or mindset or looking at ourselves help our teaching Okay, so I want to look, I want to go carefully through the questions. So, uh, Nelly, can I go back again to the previous slide? Okay, so, why do we need to ask ourselves the right questions? Where do we get inspiration from? And how do we write reflective articles? So, I'm going to talk about all of these things, about why it's important to ask those questions. And where we get inspiration from but maybe uh, because some of you have already read this book uh, you can write in the chat box why you think we need to ask ourselves questions um, now I didn't talk about the image actually so the questions are based on the image okay now some of you who've seen me before or looked at my PowerPoints know that I like the iceberg analogy um, all of these questions are to do with the iceberg. Why do we need to look beyond the surface? 
why do we need to look down here? So everything, the whole book of this act of teaching and reflective blogging for me is all about this iceberg. So the questions are about beneath the surface. Yes, exactly. Find the 95%. And that means, uh, Tom, I think you've answered all of these questions in one go. Because why, where, and how we do all of these things is because we're missing a lot. We're missing 95%. Yes. And why we have to ask why the less obvious is important. So my fourth question is, what if there was already a teacher journaling book for collaborative professional development? And we know there is, and Janet and I and Helene have read it. Um, maybe some of you have as well, or maybe some of you read uh, the articles of David, David Dubelbeis. Why do we ask? Um, I, why do we need to ask ourselves the right questions? Why do we need to find the other 95%? Oh, Eva, that's lovely. Serendipity, exactly. Okay, why do we need to look beneath the surface? So it may seem, we, we may think we know why, but a lot of people live on, a lot of people live on the surface. The practicalities of teaching. The what, and the practicalities, and people pre, uh, kind of forget about what's down here because we can't see what's down here. Okay, Nelly, why do we ask? But we're, we're searching now, we're just exploring, so we don't have answers yet, but if you want to answer, you can. For example, um, I asked why do we need to ask ourselves the right questions, and Tom said we need to find the other 95%. Janet said we need to reflect constantly. Um, Eva said it's all about serendipity. Um, so, and Melanie said we want to look beneath the surface, so they're your answers. Okay, uh, now, so can we look at the next slide, please? Okay, so this this is the book. Okay, now I got a special link um, so that everybody could access this book at a discount code. So David gave me that link. Um, I'll put the link in the chat box later, okay? Now, so before we look at parts of David's book, uh, I'm asking the question, what is reflective blogging? Uh, yes, it's free to read online, but David gave me an extra link. No, the, we're, yes, that's the unbear, unbearable lightness of being a teacher, and I think it's free online. And we're talking about the Zen Act of Teaching, which is also free online, but the link, um, I think the link is for something extra. Okay, so um, here's a quote. An intellectual is someone whose mind watches itself. So some people think that this is a waste of time or that we, we're all like Buddha or, um, you know, obsessed with ourselves. And also some of us don't label ourselves as intellectual. I don't label, my, label myself as intellectual, but I, I do like to think a lot. So. Um, I think we are watching ourselves in a way. So, do you agree with this concept of critical reflection? What would you call reflective blogging? Oh, that's interesting, Nelly. Okay. Um, do you agree with what he says? That an intellectual is someone whose mind watches itself. Does anyone have a different definition? of uh, critical reflection or reflective blogging. Okay, I'm glad you like it, Nancy. Yeah, I, I like that. I like the quote too, even though I don't call myself an intellectual and even though I'm aware that some people think too much uh, self-reflection is obsessive or not practical. Um, hey, that's really interesting, Melanie. I love that. Melanie says the heart watches too in reflective blogging. That's true. And um, I think Janet mentioned earlier that it's mentioned in the book and it's featured in this uh, PowerPoint as well. And I agree 100%. Um, 
I always say that blogging is about the heart and without the heart you can't blog very well so maybe that's why I don't call myself an intellectual because it seems too logical maybe without a heart I don't know um, you as an influence on your context that's really interesting okay it's great to see all the comments coming um, yes Nelly that's what I was trying to say too the word intellectual has some kinds of negative connotations in today's world um, yeah we have to observe what we do and evaluate ourselves okay so um, I think also we can say reflective blogging is self-directed learning for true professionalism and reflective writing is about you now uh, I'm going to use the book as a focus on you okay um, so what is it? Is it you as a disconnected individual or you as an influence on your environment? So uh, we've all said that we want some heart in it. So I don't think we want to be disconnected intellectuals. Um, yeah, we want to be an influence on our environment. Yeah, Tom has a great point. I think we have this feeling about the word intellectual because um, it's a new age and we're we have different concepts of words but he you know it's he still i still love his quotes exactly exactly okay wonderful comments uh, can we go to the next slide please nelly okay how to frame your random thoughts okay when i was thinking about reflective blogging and what reflective blogging is i was also asking myself what do i do when i just uh, write a reflective article and usually when i write a reflective article i'm doing it for myself and i don't have any specific agenda as such and i basically let my fingers do the typing um, so whatever comes out comes out sometimes it's, it can be something really surprising and nice but uh, sometimes we need we want to combine um, the stream of consciousness with specific uh, logic or goals um, or objectives in the topic okay so I use, I use certain tricks so what I say doesn't sound like disconnected rambling okay and um, these are what I find useful and you can tell me what you find useful okay so for example lateral thinking I think is extremely important for blogging because it's a multimedia form of communication but also any kind of good writing uh, has to have lateral thinking in it if you don't want to read an instruction manual or something like that um, Yes, I, I think Tom is saying something great here, reflecting through your own eyes and experiences. Yeah. So, yes, I think when, when I just explore through my fingertips by typing, that's, I'm doing exactly what Tom says. Okay. And what's the initial message that it might change, Tom? Having a purpose is good and an agenda is not so good. Okay, uh, so what's the difference between a purpose and an agenda? Let's say an agenda is a timetable or a program or your external goals, perhaps. And I think the purpose is uh, who you really are as a person, who you, what you want to do with your life as a person, maybe. Oh, great, yes. Yes, yeah, so really... Yeah, I'm using I'm using the book and my own experiences as a blogger to talk about our different messages we give ourselves as individuals and the messages we give to the world through the blog. And it's definitely something that I have noticed and um, I find really interesting that how lots of people might read your blog and each person who reads it will get a different message. And uh, that's the exciting thing about what you put out there and how much of yourself you put out. And sometimes the more of yourself you put out, the more you connect with other people. Okay. Um, the book is about professional development, but I, it's about, um, the book is used in schools for professional development. So that means uh, a teacher trainer would use the book with lots of students. 
and inside the book there are journaling tasks. So I just thought it would be a good idea to take the journaling and transform it into a collaborative blogging experience. So you're not just writing in your own notebook, but teachers are blogging about the actual tasks in the book and then sharing their professional development reflective thoughts. A teacher trainer, someone who trains teachers, I mean. Okay, so, um, okay, I find uh, it's very useful to use poetic imagery. Like, so if I have some kind of fuzzy concept I'm trying to express, but I can't find the right words, I might use a quote, a quote from a poem or from a philosopher. Um, poems are very powerful. And then I use, I use the quote as a metaphor or some kind of a hook to gather all my thoughts together. Okay? And artistic imagery is the same thing. For example, I love this metaphor of the iceberg. And for me, it's also artistic. And all of you had an artistic response to it with the great um, quotes you gave me about finding your 95% or looking beneath the surface and so on. Okay? Um, Quotes, as we said, in general, all kinds of quotes help us to gather our thoughts together. And I, I love metaphors. Um, so in a lot of previous presentations or articles, I've used strong imagery and strong metaphor to collect ideas together because we all have ideas. We're not just here to say how to do something or here's the next lesson plan. It's something uh, beneath the surface how we evolve as teachers and people and connect. And not only that, but how we speak to the potential in our students. Um, I spoke about potential a lot in my uh, first webinar. So to reach someone's potential is not to talk about what's there and what we've made. It's about what we want to make and what we want to express. Okay? And multimedia stories also help so the thing is, sometimes we want to talk about abstract ideas. So I think when we combine the abstract ideas with visual, uh, poetic, or framed inside stories, then we get this, the stream of consciousness unplugged, but not so chaotic that people cannot connect. So I think that the metaphors and the imagery and so on connect us with other people. And so. And I see Fabiana here too, this is fantastic. So as I show these images and talk to you, I'm getting this big stream of insights back from you. So that's what I call the connection. Uh, Victor, it's never too late to start writing. And um, most of my blogging network of teachers are non-native speakers. And uh, Fabiana, who just came in, is a non-native speaker who started writing recently and she's had a brilliant start to her blogging journey. Okay? And I find that non-native speakers make the language much richer. And that's a huge experience I've had, actually. I'll mention one experience. One experience was um, when I was actively uh, running a Facebook group and actively interacting with students of English. And with a team of other teachers, some of us who are native speakers, we shared quotes from writers and we started our own poetry writing games. Um, some students from countries like Tunisia, um, uh, places all over the world, started to write poetry. Um, they were using imagery from their own cultures and thoughts from their own cultures in the English language. And the poems that they wrote where they seem so much more creative and different than a typical poem a native speaker would write because they're, they were bringing in things from their culture. It was a cultural exchange of ideas in beautiful words. So I, you, should, you should see not being a native speaker as an advantage to your writing and not a disadvantage. It's global. And I love reading articles by people from different cultures. We learn so much. So, I hope we got timid out of the way. Okay, now, so that's it. Let's unplug our stream of consciousness and see what's happening. Um, can we check the next slide, please? We all make mistakes, and I, I make lots of typing mistakes as well. 
Okay, now I'm quoting another writer colleague of mine. Find he wrote an article recently called "Find Creativity Within Constraints," and I'm putting that here because um, it's about the idea again that when we get too philosophical um, or we want to look at the other 95 percent or we want to go down here beneath the surface uh we might get lost and our thoughts get all muddled up so uh, there's something that i realized that i love and then i saw that andre had actually written about this i realized that when you have limits on how to express yourself you become more creative okay so for example going back to what i did with international students on facebook um, when we used to have uh, acrostic poetry writing sessions and in acrostic poetry you're limited in how you write because you have to use the first letter of um, each sentence as it is and it comes from a word now probably most of you know what that is okay but I put an example in case anyone is not familiar so let's say the word reflect okay if you want to if you want to turn reflect into an acrostic poem you would be limited in your expression because the first line must begin with r the next line must begin with e and the next line must begin with f and it has to kind of make some sense in a poetic way right yes creativity is spontaneous but sometimes we have too many ideas it, when you're kind of lost down here, you, you have too many ideas and you don't know what to do. So if you have too many ideas, it's good to anchor your ideas in a certain way. So um, that's why I think uh, we can limit ourselves with a poem or a limit or a quote. And it's not so much a limit as a kind of a focus, a focal point. Okay, so I recommend that you read this article later. Um, I, I'll have the link on the PowerPoint where you can access it later. And I have a link to an article I wrote about blogging as well because um, when, when I was asked to write about blogging, first of all, I thought this is brilliant because I love blogging. But then I didn't know how to focus because blogging means the world to me. It's like a universe of expression or communicating and what what you talk about first so um, I started this article with a quote also by Albert Camus which had um, three images in the quote and I based my whole discussion about blogging on those three images so this is for when you have too many ideas or you don't know where to focus that's when you can find creativity within certain constraints Okay. Okay. Any co any comments or questions in this part before I go on? Yes, they do. I I love using quotes, Melanie. Okay. And quotes and pictures and even videos. Um. Sometimes I also use messages from songs. Okay. Um, all right, could I have the next slide, please, Nelly? Okay, this is another example of creativity within constraints. So, actually, once a student uh, sent me a message and asked me what makes a great teacher, and she told me it was her assignment for university or something. And any of you who are active teachers on Facebook, probably get lots of inbox strange messages from would-be students asking you to do everything for them and normally I mean I can't answer questions all day in my message box because you know we have work to do and certainly I wouldn't want to uh, write someone's essay for them but I like the question so I decided to write an article about it for my own professional development and um, so what makes a great teacher is another one of those huge open questions that make you look beneath the surface. So uh, I was reading some psychology about competence at the time uh, I got the question and I decided to tie it in with the levels of competence. So I wrote this article about a great teacher 
um, from these perspectives. So unconscious incompetence is when you don't know that you don't know something. Conscious incompetence is when you know that you don't know something. Conscious competence, you know that you know it. And unconscious competence, you know it, but it has become automatic. Um, so the automatic skills we have, like driving or things like that. Okay? So, uh, anyway, I found that... Sorry, one moment, please. Okay, so anyway, um, I found that this is very interesting for life, but also for writing, thinking and reflecting. And I also use the same concept to talk about what makes a great student as well. So I'm showing these as things to help you to write reflective uh, articles. Okay, right. And there are links to read later for those. Have any of you heard of this before? Oh, you heard my, my child's voice, Nancy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I also love the slides. Um, oh, what does it mean I in like Spanish, Victor? It's, it has this calming effect. And it's blue. It's kind of a turquoise. Oh, to be not responsible. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. Okay. I suppose, I think when we are un unconsciously incompetent, that's when we are irresponsible. And that, that reminds me of politicians who, well, they pretend to be unconsciously incompetent because uh, when we do certain things, uh, we block them out and we don't know we're doing them. So we throw them into our unconscious minds so we can be irresponsible. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is just a quick list of things that help me to write reflective articles uh, poetry constraints, philosophy, psychology, stories, and daily life. Um, this, stories are supposed to be the most powerful thing. So every article is really a story. Um, if every article is a story, then it definitely needs some uh, imagery in it. So the imagery can be from our multimedia, or it can be from the way we write with poetry and stories to put imagery into our works. OK? Um, next, please. I'm not sure why the slides aren't working today, but thank God um, I have Nelly to move them. Right, now I'm inside the act, the Zen act of teaching. Um, sorry. Yes, what you see is poetry constraints, philosophy, psychology, stories, in daily life. Do you want me to go to the next one? Would you like? Okay. If you want to see them all, you can see them all, and then they're all here. There are 12 slides. Okay. Sorry about that. Because uh, it's so this big long slide, uh, festival we have today. 10. Okay. Um, so um, I think this slide, I'm not sure if this was the right slide because. Uh, Nelly, is there a slide before this one? Because I think there was an introduction to the book first. Oh, okay. Uh, Nelly, do you mind looking uh, two slides away? Two slides away to see if I mix them up. Oh, maybe not. Okay, I'll go back to the previous slide. Uh, okay, the slides are mixed up now. 
No, it's on can slide we, 10. Can we try to go back? What we see here, it oh, says, sorry. oh, you mean it's supposed to have um, something moving on it? Let me try. Is there an animation? Okay, that's the next one. Slide 11, about you, reflect your own strength. What makes you a great teacher? Okay. Okay, I, I think that's the last interruption. Um, so I'll I'll edit this afterwards so the recording won't show these interruptions. Um, so I don't see anything. On um, Natalie, can you go back to where I was before because the slides seem to be mixed up. So maybe it's before. Maybe it's this one or this one. No, we did that. Um, maybe this one. So are you there? How to make blogging a part of your online presence? Uh, yes, the one after that. Yeah, it looks okay. I see. Okay, that's okay. Right. Yeah. It um, let me see. Um, yeah, slide 10. Sorry about that. No, but we're on slide 7. Find creativity within constraints. Do you want okay, to anyway, there will be a lot to discuss of these slides. So anyway, in slide 10, 10, the image no there Here's was the a visualization of Pleasure part of them, the book. And those of you who have read the book, grow. I think you okay. know. Uh, Nelly, is it moving? Oh, it's not moving. So I'm there now, Sylvia. Can't you see it? Oh, I don't think so. No, no. What is supposed to move? Do you want me to go to slide? We're on slide yeah. 10. Oh, it didn't move for you. Oh, you don't slide see slide 10? They're looking at... Uh, yeah, the slide I need. Without the noise of um, competition. When you have mastered this, your students will also discover it. So it's you. about the noise of competition. I guess so. Okay, this, yeah, this slide here is about something we're going to do after. Okay. Okay, what do you remember from the book, um, Janet and Helena? Nelly, is there a problem with moving? If, if I can't move, I just have to talk from here. No, it's like number 10. Yes. That's a great one as well. Okay, no, Leanne, it's not moving. Okay. Yeah, that's right. 
No, I can I do what's everyone looking at now? Oh, so I'm the only one who can't see it then. So it's just stuck for me. Okay, well, um, I'm going to look at it from where I am here. So, yes. Um, okay, there were some really great, great quotes from the book. Um, the quote was, and I think someone already said it in the chat box, that um, the quote was that... Uh, we have, there's no competition really, we just think there's competition. So the only competition is with ourselves. So that, uh, it's quite clear on the slide, I think, anyway, um, this part here, that we have to forget about the noise of competition. Okay, so um, how do we forget about the noise of competition? The idea is that, um, we can develop our own qualities. So it says that everybody has their own unique qualities. And um, I loved the way it said we have to treasure them and water them and let them grow. And it's referring to our qualities. And that's why I added the images because it, I thought it was really a really nice way to describe that concept. And also, as teachers, if we think about what's important and the substance of what we're doing and why we're teaching, then we don't have to worry about competition. And the important thing is also that our students discover that they don't need to live like that, this competitive kind of rat race life, and that they feel closer to you as a teacher. So that's what that part was all about. Um, now, do you have any comments to make about this? We need people who enjoy people. Okay. Yeah, that's right, Helena. Exactly, we just need to be natural. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so, now, this was the first task of the book. Reflect upon your own strengths and what makes you a great teacher. So I thought that um, I would love to get other teachers to write about that topic, what makes you a great teacher. Because um, everybody would start to, you know, go down here to find the other 95% of themselves. Um, not, not like my previous article, I wrote what makes a great teacher in general, but to be more personal and say what makes them a great teacher. And I think that there would be a lot of resistance writing this because we don't feel comfortable saying that we're great teachers. So I think if I was doing this, I would also add, um, I'd add also you can describe uh, what your other challenges may be or other places where you would like to develop, you know. So. Um, it would be nice if teachers blogged about that, what makes you a great teacher, and also what would you like to further develop. And if lots of teachers wrote about that, then we'd have a list of concerns or areas where teachers want to develop professionally, and then we could all share those ideas. So to get back to blogging, um, this would be a collaborative blogging exchange where everybody, everybody reflects in their own way, um, without any fear of judgment or competition whatsoever to truly express how they feel about what's good about their work. And then they can qualify that by saying how they want to improve um, some areas they need to further work on so that nobody feels uncomfortable talking or boasting about themselves too much, but also to open up new doorways for everyone to comment on everybody else's blog and offer insights because we all have different strengths. Okay, like some of us who work online, yeah, I think it's we so might so. be we more used to certain to types of technology, but it doesn't mean 12. that we so are as strong as another teacher in a different area. And each school and environment is different, our focus. So I think that would be really good.
and that's that's the first challenge in the book. And there are more challenges. Um, some of the slides seem to have got lost. That's why I was a bit confused before. I think some slides are, are missing, but it's okay. We can still I can still um, talk about more parts of it. Um, so I had another slide. Uh, from another quote that you've already told me, and uh, that is, teach your mouth to speak what is in your heart. So Melanie and some of you that's mentioned the, heart, sorry, that's the, okay, um, as opposed to intellectualism, right? So, teach your mouth uh, to speak what is in your heart. This is in the book, teach your mouth to speak what is in your heart. And that made uh, me about think you. about on your blogging what what's in your heart, you a great okay? Um, so that's metaphor. really important. And as a challenge, what kind of a challenge could you give yourself with that topic? I'm going to write it in the chat box because it's not on the screen. Teach your mouth to speak what's in your heart. Okay. Now, first, I'm going to see who wrote. Oh, Helena. Yeah, good. The essence of teaching is emotion. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you for adding the quote. Can everybody read it? The bottled wisdom and personal digestion of experience on the part of the teacher. Okay, so the other slide that got lost or maybe we have it Nelly can you move the slide yes so the next slide has a bottle Okay, because I got that from the bottled wisdom. So actually, I think it would be nice to create some chapters of presentations visualizing certain parts of the wisdom in this book and then have teachers share their experiences together. That would be great. Okay, it's great to have all the quotes there. So, um, Nelly, are we able to move the slide? Yes, but I can't. Oh, sorry, I forgot that I can't see it and you can see it. Okay, yes. Yes, okay, so we're going to do this now. I want you to tell me what makes you a great teacher. Um, it can be an adjective or it can be a metaphor or anything you want to say what makes you a great teacher. So do you find it difficult to say, to say that? Sacrifice, very interesting, smiling. Okay, good, we don't have any, anybody holding back. Yeah, the extra mile, okay. That's really interesting. So in what different ways do we go the extra mile? Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think I had some small stuff today. So, oh, Christina, why are you saying sorry? Yeah, staying up late, love for children. This is a great list. Oh, I, I keep the chat. I'm going to keep the chat. Uh, copy the chat so I have a list of all of those adjectives and then I can write about it later. Okay? okay. Yes, exactly. Go the extra mile. Yes, and um, somebody once said to me, you teach more than English and I thought that's that's great because we're, we're not just teaching the language, we're teaching people. Exactly. Okay, now if you were to write about what made you a great teacher, um, I, you could use these adjectives, of course, maybe with some metaphors and images and examples. So the examples would be from your teaching life with stories. Um, 
Okay. What so about uh, you, um, things so that we want to develop further for um, for doing this and um, inspiring? I like. I always want that, to develop uh, something further. There's always something um, I'm trying to learn more you. about. I think that's um, that's a very okay. Um, is there any reason why teachers and, might want to develop uh, their self-esteem further? Well, we are needed. Do we mean and student enjoy self -esteem. It because they grow up? Yeah. And if we mean student self-esteem, so that's something I read a lot about, young. definitely, <laughs> and I blog about All it right, too. Right. There's the link. We'll. We'll continue the conversation. Okay, um, wonderful. Yes, Thank the mind you. and the heart. Our next speaker is Christy. So, Chris as teachers, um, have a great day, so Can you just Thank say, you. is you there something done. that you want to develop more? Maybe it's Thank something you. you're already reading about. Oh, teachers are sensitive. <laughs> 